So the last lecture. Yep. See, time flies when you're having fun. So you can see my screen? Yep. Good. Okay, dokie. <clears throat> Sorry, Fred, I seem to have some issues with my... We might as well wait to see if a few more people show up, yeah? Yep, I think so. We don't have much snow in Ireland, you know? Perhaps once every couple of years, we'll have a week where there's snow on the ground. And maybe once every 10 or 20 years, we have what we consider to be a lot of snow. And when, when in Ireland we have a lot of snow, it all shuts down. But I have several colleagues from Russia, yeah, who work here, and they just think it's hilarious. They think it's <laughs> the funniest thing they have ever seen. Uh, you know, we have maybe, uh, oh, I don't know, two or three centimeters of snow and everybody locks them inside, locks themselves inside to hide. And so I've got one uh, lady from Russia, Elena, and uh, she shows me pictures of her mother's house where literally the only thing you can see is the roof with snow on it because the house is buried in two, three meters of snow. Yeah. And so she just walks around with uh, normal clothes and she just thinks it's very funny. All the Irish people are wrapped up in, in all special walking, you know, special shoes and special coats. And for her, it's like spring, you know. <laughs> so it's very funny. I saw the only time I saw something more extreme was when I worked in Atlanta, in the southern state of Georgia, in the USA. And really in Atlanta, they never, ever have uh, much snow. Yeah. Now, they do have a thing called freezing rain. So once every couple of years, it'll rain hard, but it's so cold that the minute the water hits the surface, it freezes. But this is very, very rare. But any time the temperature goes low, so like around zero, the whole city shuts down. They just add even people, people will sleep in their offices. Yeah, they won't go outside to drive home because it's, it's dangerous. So even Irish people think this is funny, yeah. But you should see the, you know, you should see the Russian people here when it snows and the Irish people. 
it's almost the Russian people almost have T-shirts, you know, they walk around with T-shirts and the Irish people are like wearing big furs and everything, you know, all hiding away. So how are we doing, Vladimir? Uh, pretty fine, I say. Yeah, uh, how are you? Uh, uh, right uh, now, do you have uh, like weak winter or it's one of the hardest? It's uh, like in Ireland, what happens is we're, we're you know, like you, we're, we're north, you know. So in the winter, we have uh, very short days. Yeah. And in the summer, then we have very long days. Yep. So in the summer, this in the height, the, the longest day, maybe even 1030, it's still bright. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then in the winter, it starts to go dark in uh, three o'clock, four o'clock. But we have a lot of cloud. So it sort of goes from black to dark gray to light gray to dark gray. You know, it's very overcast. So it's never very cold here. It's not really. You know, we have very moderate temperature, but it can be quite uh, wet. In so some parts of the country, it's wet. You know, it's what we call damp, where it's cold and it's wet. So it's the uh, hum opposite of humidity. You know, yeah. It's like humid but cold. And that's not so nice, especially for the older people, you know. But it doesn't get very cold and it doesn't get very hot. Not really, you know. So now we have how many people? I think it's 10. I'm not sure where all, all the people right now. Uh, I think we can wait for two more minutes and then we can yeah, start. Sure. No problem. No problem. So I have, um, you know, quite a little, uh, some pieces of, of stuff that I want to do today, if I can. So the uh, consultation tomorrow, yeah? Yeah. Uh, the format, so I should show up at about eight o'clock my time, and then yep. people will ask questions. Yep. Okay, and I will send out the the lecture notes from today. I think I've sent out everything so far. Yeah. I will send the one from today out uh, this evening. I just want to see, you know, always when I go through them, I find errors. So if I can have one last look and then make sure there aren't too many errors. As I said, one of the problems I have is that I have different. I have files, PowerPoint files and PDFs from different times. And sometimes they're not compatible. So everything looks perfect. And then I save it. And then I go back and there's there's letters missing, which is very yeah. annoying. Yeah, yeah. Very, very annoying, you know. So that's the way. And as I can see here, this uh, file has 110 pages. So it will be yeah, yeah. intense today. I was going to... I was going to have two separate files and um, because I, I I'm sorry uh, but I had in my head I had thought I would have uh, some lecture tomorrow I, oh. I knew you told me we would do consultation but you know originally I had thought oh on Saturday I have a lecture and then I don't know I got confused but anyways um, so uh, we've done already I think about 30 of the slides here more yesterday so I just went through them again and tried to refine it and uh, make it flow a little bit better. Yeah, I think that's the best way to do it, you know. The problem is time, you know, there's many, many things I would like to talk about or to say, but there's only a finite amount of time. And so I think that I have to pick out the things that I think are the most important ideas. Yeah, um, which is what you have to do anyway. And also the ideas that I think most people accept. Yeah, uh, I think this is, uh, I think this is the way to do it. So I will mention the holes, but I won't talk a lot about counter diffusion. You know, I think there's still some uh, work to do there, you know, but I give people some basic ideas and they can all go and hear your defense or your lecture for your PhD. And then they will learn all about counter diffusion. <laughs> it's complicated. So now we're about eight it's or about, six. Yep, I think we can. Start, there's no reason to wait for it. Start. The first few pieces I do anyways are sort of a little bit of revision of some of the things I said yesterday, just to remind everybody what's going on. So if somebody comes in a little bit late, they won't miss too much, yeah? I hope. Yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> we talked about these steps to uh, process this holographic data and uh, to measure the characteristics 
of the material and characterize the material. And that if we could characterize the material, if we could understand the response of these photopolymer materials, then we could do a lot of things. First of all, we could use them much better. And, we, and second, and for specific applications, we could find out the parts, the, the behavior that uh, most affects different applications. And then we could also improve the performance of those materials. And so we started talking about these, uh, material, these material models. And unfortunately, as I said to you, well, fortunately or unfortunately, when I came to start to work in this area, there weren't really many um, material models. So some people had come up with some ideas about diffusion, um, but very few people could actually tell how this low spatial frequency and high spatial frequency cutoffs, for example, exhibited in these materials. And there was very little link to the actual chemistry of the materials, okay, and the material properties. Now, I, I mean, I have to say there were some excellent work, for example, even in Russia, uh, Smirnova had done a huge amount of work. So there were, there were certainly bodies of people out there who were doing work in the area. But what you tended to find with people working in holography was the people working in holography quite interested in uh, holographic art and holographic applications like this are mass production. Um, but there was, there was only one or two commercial materials out there. There were certainly a lot of materials produced by labs around the world. Um, but people were still, uh, had still been working with silver halide and dichromated gelatin and photopolymers were relatively new. There were probably one commercial material which had been the, the DuPont type material. Anyway, and so we wanted to develop these materials because we wanted to really understand what was going on. And so, as I mentioned the last day, the first model I certainly became aware of was this photopolymerization driven diffusion. And this was Zhao and Morales. And you had the interference pattern initiates polymerization. So we talk about photopolymerization. In exposed region, the polymerization removes monomers, you, and it's localized. So where the light produces the radical, that's where you get all your polymer. And monomer then diffuses from dark regions to bright regions because the polymerization uses up monomer. And the polymer generally is assumed to be quite big and heavy, so it doesn't move very much, but the monomer does move from the dark regions into the bright regions. And if you do this nice and slowly, you have a nice controlled operation. So here's your reference. Here's your basic idea. Homogeneous medium becomes inhomogeneous and you have an exposing pattern, which is cosinusoidal. And again, what's important here is this K vector. This is the K vector we talk about in relation to our electromagnetic models. And that's going to be defined as two pi divided by the period of the exposing beam. And this visibility tells you the ratio between the two exposing beams essentially. And typically we're going to have that ratio equal to one. And again, we concentrate on this cosinusoidal uh, idea, not, not just because it makes the maths easier potentially, but because if we understand the spatial frequencies, how the material behaves for different exposing periods, for different spatial frequencies, we basically can build up a picture of how the model behaves. Also, you know, again, this is physical reality. This is the thing that's going in there. So I did this the last day, and I just want to again remind you that we have these monomer concentration, diffusion, and a rate of polymerization, the rate of removal of monomer. So your conversion of the monomer into the polymer. We've got this polymerization we assume directly related to the intensity through a constant kappa. Okay, this is a fairly important uh, assumption. And then you have this diffusion equation, which is driven. And to solve this, we can substitute in Fourier series for the monomer concentration, a Fourier series for a diffusion constant here. And we've already said that this here is related here to a cosine. And then we do exactly the same thing as we did in relation to Koeckling. We match up the coefficients. And what we do is we get a set of first order couple differential equations. And we start off with our monomer, our monomer equations. And we have here the zeroth order and the first order. But of course, we'll have a second and third order, et cetera. And this alpha here is associated with the diffusion constant. The fact that the diffusion constant is going to be changing as we expose, as we make the more material more dense. So we like this because the maths reminds us of Koeckling. It's easier to do this. And if we plug these equations in, and then we recall that the uh, polymerization, the amount that's polymerized is going to be related here to this term here. This is the removal of monomer. So that removal produces polymer. So that's a measure of the production of polymer, that term there. If we integrate that term from zero to whatever time we stop the exposure, we're going to get the amount of polymer which is produced. And we talk about capital N as a representation of this polymer. So if we can solve these equations here, 
we can go away and plug them in and we can solve a set of equations, again, harmonic series, which is going to tell us how much polymer is produced. And this will be the DC monomer, and this will be the sinusoidal amplitude, this U1 zeta, and zetas are dose, and the, some measure of the amount of energy we're putting in and the effect that has in the material. And then this here is our DC polymer variation, and this is our first harmonic for the polymer variation. And we're going to assume that that refractive index is proportional to this. Whatever amount of polymer we produce, that amount is going to produce a certain amount of refractive index variation. And we have these curves where we show the DC to monomer decreasing, and then the monomer here, the first harmonic, the sinusoidal variation of the monomer here is exactly out of phase. This is negative. It's out of phase with the illuminating beam because where it's bright in phase, we're going to get polymer. We're going to remove monomer. And therefore, the concentration of, of monomer is going to be out of phase with the concentration of polymer. And here with these dark solid lines are basically gives information about as we increase the time of exposure here to zeta, we're going to increase the average amount we're going to increase the first harmonic and we're going to increase the second harmonic. There's going to be production of some uh, higher harmonics. And quite importantly, we've got this idea that as we increase the actual exposure and we take the maximum values of N1, which is telling us information about the grating, we're going to get this variation as a function of this term here. And so we can look at our cross-sectional refractive index profile or density profile for the uh, polymer and we can look at the resulting diffraction efficiency. And again, looking at the solid line here, we see that for ours, one, uh, we get some distortion. Me, I, I for ours, equal to 50, we get no. Yes, please. Uh, I'm just finding uh, a problem connecting the math to the physics here. So when we speak in the term of uh, harmonic uh, monomer concentration, so isn't the total or well, the I, sorry, concentration? I find, I, I, sorry, excuse me. You're, you can can you, you your your voice is modulating a lot for me. If you could speak slowly, yeah, and clearly. Uh, okay, okay. So um, I'm finding a problem connecting the math to the physics here. So when you speak in the term of monomer concentrations yes. in the harmonic monomer concentration, yes. So isn't the real or the total concentration yes. uh, is the summation of all the harmonics, or not exactly. So the, the so um if I if I sorry excuse me uh, my computer seems to have frozen here excuse me um I don't know why oh yeah okay sorry so um so we have a Fourier uh, expansion yeah. so this is the total monomer concentration yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, and then these are the amplitudes of the harmonics. Yeah. And they vary with time. Okay. Okay. So we substitute this, these terms in here. Yeah. And we get a set of first order coupled equations in terms of these harmonic amplitudes. Uh -huh. Is that okay? Yeah. And then we can solve those equations. Because, for example, we have an initial concentration when the zeta is zero, which is just going to be uniform or DC. And then we can solve these equations to find out, for example, what the first harmonic amplitude is. Okay, I mean, what does it mean, the first harmonic concentration? I mean, there is just one concentration there, right? Sure, there's, there's, this is the concentration as a function of position and time. And we write okay. it as a Fourier series. So we split the time variation part, which is the amplitude, from the spatial variation part. Okay. And then what we do is we look at the evolution, the growth, the change of the individual amplitudes as functions of time. Okay. And when you say the first harmonic concentration is uh, as a function of time or uh, space? Yes. So we can find a set of coupled equations for each one of the monomer harmonic amplitudes. And then we can add them all back together and we can see how the monomer cross section, the cross section of monomer concentration, which this is the cross section, will evolve as a function of time. Oh, okay. So it, we know that spatially we can write them as a Fourier series 
So all we need to know about is the time variation of the, of the harmonic amplitudes. Okay. And this is the same type of mathematics, the same process we use when we talked about Koganik. In Koganik, we just re retained two amplitudes, yeah? Yeah. Two waves. In this case, we can, of course, retain more. So I only show the first two equations here, but I note that, for example, this here would be the second harmonic. And then we would have another equation, which would be the first derivative of the second harmonic, and it would be coupled to all the other amplitudes. Is that okay? Uh -huh. Okay, and uh, could you please and go once, to the next and once point? We know and once we know the concentration of u, once we have the function, the description of u as a function of x and time, yeah? Yeah. Then we can multiply it by the f, yeah? The fxt, yeah? And we know what f0 is. And we can integrate it from zero to whatever time we want. And that will give us the total amount of polymer because it tells us how we have converted monomer into polymer. And then we can find the set of equations that govern yeah, this integral from zero to zeta of this term here will tell us how much the average um, permittivity poly poly polymer concentration changes, this first harmonic, and this, sorry, the zero to DC, and then this is the amplitude of the first harmonic. But again, we can go away and we can go for the, the second harmonic or the third harmonic of the polymer concentration. Is that okay? Okay, could you please go to the slide with the graphs, Tony? Okay, that's the next slide. So here we say, we start off with some initial concentration of monomer, okay, and it's uniform. So at this point, there are no harmonics. And then over time, the DC, yeah, the average amount of monomer is going to decrease, okay? Yeah. And then what we see is that the first harmonic increases because when we start off, we have no pattern. Yeah, we have no variation of u with, as a function of uh, time or space. But now what we see is we end up with a negative harmonic. Yeah, and that's because in the dark regions, which are exactly out of phase with the exposing light, we have a sinusoidal maximum associated with the monomer concentration. So it's not that we've actually increased the size of monomer in the dark regions, but what we've done is we've taken away monomer in the bright regions, and it's left us with a sinusoidal variation of monomer concentration, which is exactly out of phase with the exposing light. Okay. Okay. okay? Yeah. And, and, and the next uh, slide, please. Where, so this uh, slide here. Where, so this no, slide I, shows. Yeah. I mean the slide where uh, the monomer concentration is the function of uh, phase. Where it's the next slide? Could you please go to the next slide? This one? Yeah. This. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this shows the polymer concentration, and the polymer concentration is in phase with the exposing intensity pattern. Okay, but depending on the value of this parameter r, we either have a very high fidelity recording, yeah? So this large value of r means that we have a small period or we have a high, or we have a, a, a low polymerization rate. And because we have a small period or we have a high polymerization or low polymerization rate, there's plenty of time for the monomer to diffuse from the dark regions into the bright regions. And so what happens is we can get a very nice, clear sinusoidal recording of the exposing intensity. But if we decrease the R value, that means that it takes, we have a big period and it takes a long time for the monomer to diffuse in to the bright region, or we have a high polymerization rate. So we use up the monomer very quickly in the bright region. And so we end up with a distorted, a distorted cross-sectional polymer profile we produce higher harmonics. Okay, so could you please tell me here the um, polymer concentrations, how is calculated? So, and, uh, okay. so, we, so once we know our monomer variations, 
okay. we can use our monomer rate variations to calculate our polymer variations because we know that the polymer yeah is pro is proportional to the amount of removed monomer so yeah, using right. our monomer concentrations yeah and how they vary yeah we can go away and calculate how much polymer we have produced okay so essentially we can use this part here this is telling us we remove monomer so if we know how much monomer we have removed and we've got a perfectly local situation then we simply integrate over this form this over all time and then that will tell us how much polymer we have at any position x oh yeah okay yeah yeah i see thank you no this is very good because you see, the problem is for me, this is very obvious, okay? Because I've done this so many times, okay? So that, you know, so it's really good for you to ask because otherwise I don't know you don't know, okay? So you stop me anytime you want, okay? So, and then we can go from this and we say, well, if our refractive index is directly proportional to the concentration of polymer, then we can take, for example, the fundamental period and say let's well let's ignore all the higher orders and let's just use Koganik. and if we take that value of n1 which is proportional to the capital n1 the fundamental harmonic of the of this uh, grating yeah then we can go away and calculate the diffraction efficiency so in our experiments we're going to measure the diffraction efficiency and then we're going to try and use that to get back to our refractive index and then back from our refractive index to understand what's happening inside the material. Okay, that's the process. Now, the problem is that this type of model, this photopolymerization driven diffusion tells you, explains well what happens when you have a big period and the monomer can't diffuse well into the bright regions. And therefore you use up all the monomer in the Bryce region and therefore you end up with the production of a rectangular shaped profile and higher harmonics. But if you look at the big period, the small periods, what this model tells you is that the, the smaller the period, the better the model works and the better the material works. Okay, specifically the better the material works. So the finer the period, yeah, the higher the spatial frequency, the better this material works, the more pure you turn a sinusoidal exposure into a sinusoidal variation of refractive index. And unfortunately, that's not true. And it's also very important, the high spatial frequency, because that tells you about the resolution of the material. Okay? You want to be able to record fine things, very fine structures. But in most materials, there's a maximum that you can record. You can't go below a certain period. The material doesn't react anymore. And so while the PDD tells you about what happens if you increase or decrease your intensity, uh, especially if you increase it, or it tells you what happens if your period increases, yeah, it doesn't tell you about the high spatial frequency cutoff. So I'm sorry, I seem to be having some trouble here with my mouse, uh, which is a pain in the neck. And uh, actually here is the question from Vasily. Yeah. Uh, hello. Um, Hello. I just wanted to ask this assumption uh, of proportionality between the uh, first harmonics of the polymer uh, distribution and uh, N1 from Kogelnik. Uh, first of all, is it really a good assumption? And no. no. What are the ways of verification? Whether so, I'm, so we go down and we use Lorenz Lorenz. So we take the individual contributions, okay, to the density, if you want of the various elements, the compounds that you put into the material. And we can use that then to actually go away and predict the refractive index modulation. But this was the first model that people actually produced. Okay. And there's many, many things wrong with this model. But the most fundamental issue is that this model does not tell you about a high spatial frequency cutoff. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so the point here is that it's, I always say to people, it's like you have a, a, a model that describes how a, a car, an automobile works, okay? So this model tells you, it doesn't tell you many things, but it tells you how the car goes backwards, 
yeah how the how you can drive the car backwards but it doesn't tell you how to drive the car forward and most people want to drive the car forward yeah okay so the next model is the non-local model this is the and here we say that we have initiation and the chain grows and then we have termination so this chain growth, the removal of monomer, yeah, which leads to polymer, is happening at times and positions after the original initiation. If we assume a local model, then where we start to grow is where we finish growing and all the polymerization is at that point. But that's not physical. There must, it must grow away from where you initiate it and then it's going to stop eating up or using monomer some displacement away, okay? And so you have an initiation, a propagation, and a termination. And you've got a non-local process. And it's non-local in time and in position. And so we have exactly the same polymerization rate proportional to our intensity. And we have the same first part of our differential equation. But now what happens is we have the removal of the polymer, but we have removal of that monomer. Sorry, we have removal of monomer and conversion into polymer but we have that removal happening at times and positions after we originally initiated. So if we initiate here at some position and some time, X and T, then basically we're gonna have removal of monomer happening all the way from over this T prime and X prime. We have to allow for this chain propagation and removal of monomer away from the place where you actually start. And to begin, yeah, in this model, it was assumed that there, was no, there were no temporal effects. So we just said, well, whatever's happening, it's happening quickly, but there's going to be some smearing in space. The chains are going to grow and they're going to be spread out in space. So we say the chain grows instantaneously, but it removes monomer over some region in space. And this acts to smear out the recorded pattern. And then, we can substitute our Fourier series into this equation, assuming that we have this non-local, which is Gaussian, okay? So essentially saying that the likelihood that we remove monomer far away from the initiation decreases as you move further away. And it will, in the limiting case, become the local case as the, the, this parameter, this length parameter, length squared parameter goes to zero it goes to the local case and your integrals will disappear and you're back to the pre-DD case, the local case. And again, you substitute in your Fourier series and you find coupled differential equations for the harmonic amplitudes of the monomer. And you can use these then, once you've found them, to go back in yeah, to your integral here and find out equations for the actual polymer concentration harmonics. Yeah. And we then see these dashed lines that depending on how non-local we are, as yes, we become more non-local, as we that, it, that sigma increases in size and the chains remove monomer over a bigger area or volume inside the layer, what happens is you end up reducing the size of the harmonics. So you start off with a strong, with a, let's say in the simplest case with a strong sinusoid, and then basically as you make the thing more local, you essentially decrease the amplitude of the harmonics. And if we go and look at the result, we see that as we increase the non-locality, we basically end up with weaker and weaker modulations on the polymer concentration. And also we have a, a hot, an even stronger reduction in the harmonics. So if we start off with something with very strong harmonics, as we have a more non-local material, the amplitude of the variation decreases, but also the amplitudes in the harmonics decrease more quickly. And so we can see what happens as we go from something which is local to something which is less local. We decrease our amplitude, we decrease the higher harmonics even more, we smooth it out, and we change appreciably the diffraction efficiency because as our first harmonic gets weaker, the amplitude of our first harmonic of polymer gets weaker, and we've assumed this linear relationship between the polymer and the refractive index, the resulting diffraction grating is going to get, is going to scatter less light. Okay. 
And so we can go and we can take our growth curves, we can convert our diffraction efficiency into our fractive index module using Kogelnik. So assuming we only need two waves and we can neglect our second order derivatives. And we can fit this with this model, we can do that numerically. And we can extract out values for the non-local parameter and for the R parameter, yeah, which is telling you the ratio between your um, between the, the strength of the effects of diffusion and the strengths of the effect due to the uh, polymerization. And we can get pretty good fits to our experimental curves. And we can also do experiments and we can see the drop off at low spatial frequencies and the appreciable drop off at high spatial frequencies as well. So we cannot record the finer, the finer, the grating we try to record, the less modulation we get. If we keep everything else the same, the exposing intensity inside the material, yeah, this, the, the material we use, everything. And all we do is we change the angle between the two exposing beams and we allow for friend reflections, okay? What we find out is we get less bang for our buck. We get less refractive index modulation uh, as we change, as we in decrease the period, as we increase the spatial frequency. And that's just the reality. And the PDD model, the local model doesn't tell us that. The PDD model tells us that we come up here and then we go straight across, it's a straight line, yeah? Yeah, we can go to the smallest period, the highest spatial frequency we want, and we get no drop off in the recorded refractive index modulation. But the reality is that we do, and the reality is that we want to record very fine interference patterns, and therefore we need a model which tells us about this type of behavior. And that's what the non-local model tells us. And so we can talk about the extra things. The PDD model explains the big periods, okay? And the NPDD explains the small periods. And we can now predict the high spatial frequency cutoff. That's what we can do. We still haven't talked about the effects of the dye really. We've just said, oh, you put light in and then the intensity causes polymerization. And we haven't talked anything really about the mechanics of this diffu of the diffusion. We've talked about diffusion, but we haven't talked about initiation or termination. But we have got a mathematical model and we can use it. Okay, now the next point is to come along and say, well, can we take this mathematical model and do other mathematical things that make it work better or behave more physically? Okay, and we can. Okay, so one of the things we're gonna talk about, and this is the chemical type equations that you see, is this idea of the dye. And we have a, an initiator here. This is I is initiator. And we have a photon and we get radicals. So we have to talk about this. And then we have this idea of the radical produces an active chain. And then this adds together to give us chains with some rate. And all of these things have some rate associated with them. And we can have bimolecular termination where you stop the growth and primary termination. So these are different mechanisms by which you can stop growing the polymer chains. And you can also have a process of inhibition where you put light into the system, but there are scavenger molecules that stop any change in the refractive index. So basically you put light in and some chemical, photochemical reaction has to take place before you can start actually producing any polymer, before you can start producing any refractive index modulation. And I threw this in here, it's very, very complicated. We're gonna come back to figures like this, but you've got your effects due to your dye up here, initiation, the growth of chains, you've got propagation of chains, you've got termination of chains, and then inside here, you've also got this inhibition process. And we're gonna talk about this a little bit later, but I just wanna say, look, this process is more complicated than you might think, okay? And this is just for a free radical case. So again, we've got the photopolymerization process, We've got the effects of the photopolymerization process on the rate of diffusion, okay? And we've got the non-local model, which involves the introduction of this parameter, this non-local uh, response function, and especially this sigma, which is a length squared. It has a values a length squared, and it tells you about the non-local, the distance over which the chain grows. And this drives the diffusion equation. And we use this parameter, the square brackets and M to talk about our monomer concentration. And very simply, we've got the polymerization that's produced is equal to this integral of this over space and time. 
what we're going to assume effectively is that we don't have any non-locality in time. We just have locality in space. And then finally, we're going to have the refractive index as a constant times the distribution due to the polymer. Okay. Now, the adjusted NPD boils down to a couple of things that we're going to try and describe what's happening, the interaction between the light or how the light leads to the polymerization, the generation of polymer more physically accurately, okay? Based on this idea that we have a concentration of radicals, we have a concentration of monomer, and that the rate of polymerization, so this rate of change of monomer concentration, which before we simply had the F multiplied by U, that this thing here is going to be proportional to the product of these two. We have to have radicals to have polymerization, and we have to have monomer to have polymerization, and the rate of change is going to be some constant times this, okay? And this is based on some sort of an idea of a steady state reaction, that we have some sort of steady state type reaction where basically the amount of initiation eventually is equal to the amount of termination, and we can write down things that the initiation rate equal to the termination rate is going to be somehow or other related to, again, it's going to be proportional at constant times, this radical concentration. And again, I draw you to the paper. I don't want to go through massive de derivations here. But what I do want to say is that the first person to try and deal with this was a man called Quan. Okay. And Quan didn't go back to this differential equation, this rate equation. What Quan simply said was, look, the material is not going to react to the actual intensity, which we talked about before. We had this F0 related to I, I0. It's going to relate, in fact, to the square root of this. And what he wrote down specifically was F0 times this cosinusoidal variation associated with the intensity raised to this parameter gamma. So he then had I zero to a half, he took gamma to be a half, and he had this term here raised to a half. And if we now want to use this in our differential equations, so we do a first order coupled equations, we've got to take this formula and we've got to write it as a Fourier series in terms of this K parameter. So we've had extra complication, okay? We have an cosinusoidal interference pattern, but the material isn't, really, isn't act reacting to that intensity it's reacting to the square root of that intensity. And again, we have something to do with the, diff the that the, the monomer diffusion, we're going to have to allow for the fact that if we have polymer, the polymer maybe is going to be denser, and so it's going to affect the rate of diffusion of the monomer. Where you've got a lot of polymerization, the monomer will diffuse more slowly. But the crucial point here is this idea that the material is not reacting to the intensity, but it's reacting to the square root of the intensity. So we have our previous model where the gamma was equal to one and reacted to intensity. And now this idea that it doesn't react to the square root of the intensity of the field. And again, in comparisons with experiment, it's found out that we get better quality fits when we take gamma is equal to a half than if we use the gamma equal to one, okay? And we note that this gamma is equal to a half, however, is still an approximation we actually need to take account of the rates of change of the polymerization. This is based around an assumption as to steady state operation. But when we start exposing, and typically when we finish exposing, we're not going to be in the steady state. But still, we can take the models we have so far, we can put in the square root, and we can modify the uh, differential equations appropriately. And we can do all the things we did before. Yeah, we can do comparisons. We can also take different types of non-local response. So here we've still assumed that we have a non-local response, which is this Gaussian. We can go away and say, well, it, it doesn't have to be Gaussian. It could be any other type of function with these very basic sets of properties. And so we can try different types of functions with a certain set of properties. And we find out the results are you know, um, uh, similar in a way in terms of the gross behavior of the material. And we can also keep in a lot more harmonics, yeah? So we can keep higher harmonics. So we would not just U0 and U1 or M0 and M1, but we can keep in four or five monomer harmonics and we can keep in four or five polymer harmonics and we can see how the numerics converges as you increase the number of harmonics. And this becomes interesting because with the half here, we of course end up with an infinite series here as well. An infinite Sheridan, Fourier series. Excuse yeah? me, here's one yeah. more question from Vasily. Please. Uh, professor, I just wanted to, to, to make it clear for myself. Yeah. Did you understand right that in this Lawrence model, 
we see the response of the material to the field? Yes, effectively. Well, yeah. is this a, a kind of a model or it, does it have some physical meaning behind it? If, 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 if we go to the rate equations, it's the limiting case of the rate equations. And what it basically uh, involves, I think, uh, is the coupling of the uh, exposing electric field to the electrons, if you think classically, okay? That that is the thing that actually produces the actual variation, the excitation of the electrons, which then leads to the production of the actual radicals. Okay, but as again, okay. the point here is that this is an assumption, it's based on assumptions around steady state, okay? So it's an improvement on, a, the, on assuming that the material reacts to the intensity. It certainly gives better quality fits and you can give a basis, you can provide a basis for the actual assumption that you have to take the field, not the intensity. But again, it's still maths. We're basically doing mathematics, yeah? And sort of a little bit of physics, yeah? We're not talking about the real material here, the real interactions that are taking place in the material. So, so we, we, despite the fact that this model actually leads to better description yeah. we are not to make conclusions that materials in this case respond to field not to intensity well i think it's i mean i think it's reasonable to assume well okay so first of all just to be very clear there's a lot of different materials okay so you know uh, this now i'm talking about free radical polymer um so but i think it's reasonable to say that in a sort of a steady state condition where you've got, if you'd like, as many chains terminating as you have uh, initiating, okay? So you can imagine in the middle of the process, okay, where you've got a dynamic process, you've got the monomer diffusing in, and you've got this region where you've got steady state behavior. Then basically in that region, you provide much better fits by assuming that the excitation of the actual uh, radicals, generation of the radicals, the polymerization process is proportional to the exposing field, not to the exposing intensity. Now you still have the, the period, yeah? Uh, you still have the actual, uh, so it's not that, when I talk about the field, in a way I'm talking about the absolute value of the field, okay? Or, yeah, in a certain sense, yes, yeah? But, um, but what I'm trying to get across here is that, uh, and I can, I can send you on the references with the derivation and what Quan did, okay? But basically, yes, it produces better fit. I don't want to definitively say to you, oh yes, we assume the material reacts to the electric field because as I said to you, because there's so many approximations here and because this is mathematics more than physics, yeah? But I think there's a reasonable argument to be had for the actual coupling between the electric field and the electrons and the potential in the, when you've got a lot of electrons and a lot of electric field that on average, that's what's going to be happening. Thank you, okay. Okay. Okay, now. So, in fact, the generation of the radicals, okay, are going to be related to this generation of these radicals is going to be a difference between the rate of radical generation and the rate of chain initiation, because the radicals are going to be acting, reacting with the monomer, okay, and therefore there's a process by which they're removed, okay. The radicals can basically, you excite them, they're then used up when you convert, when you produce initiation of chains, and a certain amount of them are just gonna pop back down to the ground state. But you can talk about the initiation concentration, you can talk about the interaction between the radicals, the concentration of radicals and the monomer, and a steady state condition where this rate of change of the radicals is equal to zero, where these things cancel out. And, and that's kind of a process that you can use and will generate, will produce the sort of uh, result that Quan has. Yeah? It, or it comes out of equations like that. But again, because you have a dynamic situation, this is not going to hold throughout the entire polymerization process, the entire growth of the, of the actual grating. Okay, the other thing is that we have these two different types of termination. We have a chain chain termination, which we call bimolecular, and we've got a radical chain termination. And this termination is going to depend on the fact that you've got two growing chains, yeah, two growing chains. And so it's going to depend on the uh, termination, which is going to be related to the monomer concentration, okay? 
Whereas radical chain termination, it turns out, again, I'm, I'm not going to give you the derivations here, but what I'm going to tell you is that you can show that the radical chain termination is a primary process. So in this case, if you've got a lot of long growing chains or growing chains, then this will be a dominant process. Whereas if you've got a lot of radicals yeah, present, which would be particularly early in the process, you're going to have a, pro a process which is dominated by primary termination. Now, again, how do you include this in the mathematics? Well, it turns out that you can include it here in your polymerization process. You can build in the termination process into this by putting a power here on your monomer. And again, typically what you've got is you've got some sort of assumption in relation to the, the relationship between the monomer concentration and the actual excited monomers or chain growth in the process. And you know, if you've got a lot of monomer, then basically you've got a chance for there to be a lot of radicals and therefore you've got a chance for there to be a lot of primary termination. Whereas on the other hand, and this process here, you, the effects of the monomer concentration is less because a lot of the monomer has already been converted into polymer. And again, there's a sort of a derivation here, but it's a very hand-waving type of discussion. But again, what happens is that if you go away and you fit your data, you capture a lot of data, you, you've got data for different exposure intensities and everything, different pop, uh, periods. What happens is you see that if you take the gamma equal to a half, which we previously talked about, and beta equal to two, so you assume the radical chain termination dominates, then what happens is you again get better fits to the actual experimental data. Yeah, you get a better fit, this empirical process. So it appears that the materials that we deal with, this acrylamide, in those cases, these parameters in our model appear to give us a better prediction of what is actually produced in terms of diffraction efficiency. And if we use those parameters and we go back and look at the parameter values we find that we need to use in order to get good quality fits, we find out that we have a diffusion constant associated or a monomer, which is about 10 to the minus 11 centimeters squared per second, and a non-local response length, the square root of this sigma parameter, which is 67. And again, this is now, this is a long drawn out process of just repeating the experiments and repeating the fitting process using all sorts of starting points and getting the best quality fit you can. And at the end of the day, you get the best quality fit when you take these two parameters to have these values and you take the physical constants to have these values here. And that's the only argument we would have for the reasonableness of it. Okay, and again, the literature where people have actually talked about these things and derived them and use them, not usually in the case of holography, more in the case of polymerization processes. So we talked about the idea that, well, we're going to have a, a situation where monomers converted into polymer and the polymer takes up less space than the monomer. And therefore, we're going to have to have some change in the dimensions of the material because if the polymer takes up less space than the monomer and we're converting monomer into polymer, then we're going to have media, which is going to have a reduction in uh, its uh, volume. And so what we talk about is the idea that we generate holes or vacuoles. Every time a monomer attaches to a chain, we basically now have the polymer, the monomer space has been converted into a reduced space when it's attached to the polymer plus some hole. And these holes can diffuse and these holes can also collapse. And as I showed you before, we saw that we do get shrinking and swelling, and this is a particularly bad material we're using, but we get appreciable shrinking and swelling, okay? We also um, talked about the idea that, that our response to the material is not just going to be local in space, it's also going to be non-local in time. So in other words, if we switch off the light, if we switch off the light, we're going to see continued evolution inside the material. So for example, we're still going to have a gradient of monomer and we're not that and things are not going to settle down inside the material until we have an equality. We've equalized the density across the material. The monomer excess will move, will move into the, the previously brightly exposed material. But we also will have continued chain growth. So the chains will continue to grow. So if we go and we look at what the type of material we have and the refractive indices of the monomer compared to the refractive index of the polymer and compared to the refractive index of the background are going to tell us what will happen in the dark region. So for example, are we going to see an increase in diffraction efficiency after we switch off the exposing beam? 
or will we see a decrease in diffraction efficiency? Will our scattering grating get stronger or weaker? When we have equalization, but when the monomer diffuses, our, and or if the polymer keeps growing. So we have these two types of effect. And again, we took this mathematical model and we tried to extend it to include in these holes yeah, and to include this non-local temper effect. And we saw we increase, we introduced some sort of a, a time parameter here, which would allow this to happen. And we introduced also another particle, which is diffusing. And again, it's going to be the same diffusion equation here. Yeah, It's going to have this variation, but we're going to have an effect yeah, on the actual diffusion of the monomer, which is related to the fact that we have some generation of these holes, and these holes are going to evolve with respect to time. Now, this is a very incomplete model. So these mathematical models are very, very incomplete, okay? But just to indicate that these types of effects do happen, and we have to see, can we take the mathematical model and expand it to in include or explain some of these types of effects? And again, uh, sorry, excuse me, wrong direction. Sorry, excuse me, sorry, I'm very sorry. Uh, uh, sorry. Okay, now, what we were talking about before. So we now have uh, a several different things moving around inside this material, okay? We have the monomer moving around. The polymer, we assume, in once it's initiated, it's, it's held relatively rigidly, but of course it's not going to be. It's going to have some potential for diffusion, especially, let's say, when it's only two monomers together, a radical with two monomers. The diffusion rate is going to increase for those things, or sorry, it's going to become more viscous, so it's going to be harder for it to fuse as we grow the chains, but they can still move a certain amount. We've got these holes generated, these vacuoles, and we said, well, they can collapse or they can diffuse inside. And so we're going to have some idea that we have a, the rates of change of the hole, and it's going to be some ability for this thing to move, and it's going to be associated with the removal, the removal of monomer, yeah? and the rate of collapse of the actual holes themselves. So we're gonna have a dynamic process associated with these holes, which then presumably can be linked into, for example, uh, variations of the surface profile and the density of the actual material. What do we do about this conversion? So in our earliest models, when we talked about the refractive index, we simply said the refractive index was proportional to the polymer density, okay? So at a, we change the density of polymer, and at that point, we change the refractive index. But we've also talked about the monomer moving around, and now we've got these extra things called holes. Well, in that case, what we have to do is we're going to have to actually find out the volume fraction of, for example, the monomer, the evolution of the monomer, and the volume fraction of the polymer, and the volume fraction, for example, of the holes, and the refractive index effect associated with these different volume fractions. And then we put all of these things together, and these are varying as functions of time because these volume fractions are related to the concentrations of these materials. And what we will find is that if we take the first harmonic, the first amplitudes of these volume fractions, we'll, and add them all together, and these are all now terms associated with the cosine. If we add all these things together, then we're going to get our refractive index modulation, the first harmonic of the refractive index modulation. So by finding out the amount of these materials at a particular point in space, okay, or associated with a particular harmonic, we can now relate the refractive index to the evolutions of the concentrations of these different materials inside. And again, these are driven by diffusion processes, they're generated by polymerization processes, okay? And so we're going to get a refractive index, which is much more based on a physical reality inside this material. Because for example, these refractive index terms here would be the refractive index terms which are measured for those materials at the wavelength that we replay the grating with. So of course, we have some variation of refractive index with wavelength. And so if we want to find out the diffraction at a particular wavelength, we have to find out the refractive index of the various constitutive parts as functions of the wavelength. And it's, and it's not just enough, for example, here that we know the refractive index of the monomer or the polymer or the, at the holes, which we assume is going to be free space. But we've also got a background material. Our material is made with acrylamide as the monomer, but we have polyvinyl alcohol as our base, our matrix. 
And so we have to include the effects of the refractive index of this background of this matrix, this PVA into this formula in order to actually find out the effects of these various components and how they evolve as they evolve with time. So that's where our Lorentz Lorentz expression comes in. And that's how we link the refractive index modulation to the concentrations of the particular parameters. So again, these volume fractions now are going to be calculated using, for example, in this case, using this concentration of holes, using the concentration of polymer, and using the concentration of monomer. Professor Sheridan, excuse me, here's yes, one more question from Vasily. Yeah, please. Um, I just wanted to ask in this equation, what is index dark mean? What does index dark mean? This is the first question. And the second, uh, Lawrence, Lawrence, uh, as far as I know, has its own restrictions uh, sure. connected to the uh, frequency of the radiation that is used. Uh, yes. Does it prove itself correct to, to use it for, for our case? This is the second question. So the first question is that the dark is typically the refractive index at the very beginning of the process when everything is isotropic, okay? Now you can use it before or after because typically you talk about very, very small refractive index changes, yeah? For example, we're talking about a modulation value here in one in our material, which is of the order of the biggest value you get is something like 10 to the minus one, okay? Sorry, Eve, sorry, 10 to the minus two, point zero one. yeah? So all of these things are quite small, okay? But the evolutionary basis of this, when you go and you look at the evolution of the various components, you actually can see the various effects we talk about. Specifically, when we talk about what the evolution after you switch the light off, okay? So that's what this N dark is. It's the isotropic refractive index. Is that okay? Yeah, so, so I see. So it's mainly, it's the average refractive yes, index. Yes, exactly. Yeah, okay. Okay, and, thanks. and the difference, yeah. Now, the other question, sorry, what was the other question again? Sorry, oh, the, oh, the rinse, rinse. So, um, again, um, the proof of the pudding here is in the usage. So, yes, what we do specifically, for example, we would take these various materials uh, separately and we would go away and we would perform a series of uh, refractive refractometer. We'd use a refractometer and we'd use the literature to find out what these effective refractive indices are of these materials at the specific wavelength we'll be playing at. Okay. And then we go and we examine the evolution of the refractive index modulation. And as I said, we can get pretty good fits. We can achieve pretty good fits. Okay. Oh, that's cool. So again, okay. Okay. Yeah. So so the thing is. It, uh, all of this is predicated on the fact that we've got small variations and we produce pretty good fits. And then we generalize and see if we can improve the quality of the fits by basically changing the parameters we use. If, for example, we use refractive indices for the various components and we use values which are at different wavelengths, even though the changes sometimes are quite small, we don't get as good a fit. But there's an ambiguity. I would argue that the biggest ambiguity is in the noise in the diffraction efficiency measurements. Yeah. So we always have to deal with the, the fact that any diffraction efficiency measurement we make, first of all, we're measuring, we're going to be dealing with a relative value. So an output diffraction efficiency divided by an input, or we will be using the diffraction selectivity, yeah, which I mentioned previously. So there's lots of other places where we have errors. Okay. Uh, excuse me, Professor Sheridan, here yes, is, I, I have actually one question here, which mm -hmm. concerns me much. Uh, here we have actually uh, several parameters, which are volume fractions of different, uh, of different components yep, yep. and their refractive indices. Yep. And then we convert this set of parameters to only one parameter, which is refractive index modulation. Yeah. So when we are talking about the um, fraction efficiency curve, I think that it can be done by, you know, several combinations of those dynamics, uh, yep. dynamics. Yep. So there is, uh, again, quite, let's say, ambiguity yeah, here. Yes. Uh, yes. And, and my question was that, was it a problem, for example, for experiments to count, count for that? So basically, I'm going to try and address this. And the point is that there's a, there's a lot of ambiguity. But all you can do is measure the, the things you can measure 
and then work around those. And what you tend to find is if you do the, the nonlinear fitting process I talked about previously, is that you find local minima and global minima, and you try and find out the global minima, which basically produces the, the best fit and with the most reasonable set of values. And then you carry out completely different experiments. So for example, you do experiments with very big periods. You do pe experiments with small periods. You do experiments with high intensities of exposure. You vary the concentrations of the various materials inside. And some parameters are, are functions of these different things, yeah? And so what you do is, and, and there's an evolution here. So we've gone from a purely mathematical, physical type of discussion we're going more and more down to a materials type of discussion where we're bringing out the various components in the actual material. And so you've got this slow but steady process where you don't take, make any big radical steps and you try and make sure that any parameter you get, first of all, is it completely unusual compared to what's in the literature? And second of all, you do a sort of a stability analysis that you, you extract out a set of parameters and then you vary one of them, okay? And you see, does it change things for the worse, okay? So it's an iterative process and it's an, and uh, maybe if I go forward, you'll see what I mean, okay? okay. It's building confidence. You're never 100% confident because it's not derived from first principles. But to be honest, I'm not sure if you can actually derive a lot of these things from first principles, yeah? Or you can maybe, but it gets very, very complicated. Yeah, we've got the, the last sets of equations we derived were, were horrendously complicated that we published yeah we're getting you end up with more and more and more free parameters and you've got to make decisions about which are the most important well let me go forward and maybe I'll, I'll i'll assuage some of your your concerns so again we know the shrinking and swelling we can think about this too as about the polymerization cause of densification then basically monomer diffusing into the region but also when we expose that area, we're going to have some thermal effects. Yeah, the chemical reactions are exothermal. So we might expect some evaporation from that surface. And on the other hand, after the exposure, we get cooling. And it turns out that the polymer is more hydroscopic than the acrylamide. So some of that swelling, swelling could be due to effects external to the actual material. So this is all happening. All these dynamic effects are happening. And with the holes, again, we can come along and we can say the double bond, the monomer is converted to a single bond. Holes can diffuse and collapse. And we can have processes where we switch the light on. We see a generation of holes. We switch the light off and we still have polymerization taking place. So we still have generation of holes. And then on some time constant, we're going to have a decrease. So again, this here now is a non-local effect, a temporal non-local effect, but it has nothing to do with the temporal non-local function I talked about previously. This is part of the dynamics of the actual process we're talking about. So one of the things we're going to do is we're going to retain our spatial non-locality, but we're going to rely more and more on our differential equations, yeah, the descriptions of the processes taking place to take account of this temporal non-locality the fact that we still have polymerization taking place after we switch the light off, that we still have diffusion taking place after we switch the light off, okay? So we have the effects of the photosynthesizer, we have effects due to inhibition, and we have effects due to the macro radicals. So again, sorry, my, my connection to my mouse seems to have stopped. Uh, very sorry about this, so we're connected again. Hopefully the mouse doesn't die before the end of this lecture. Um, excuse me. And in this equation now we have some quantum efficiency associated with the generation, which is associated with a photosynthesizer, the dye concentration, and this initiation here, okay? We have all these, a rate of termination, a rate of inhibition, so the presence of radicals that are going to scavenge out and stop the formation of any gray, of any chains. And we're going to have, uh, and again, we've got this idea that we, whatever processes are taking place, we have some sort of steady state reaction that whatever's being taken away, okay, we're going to be able to have a, a, a generation process. I, so it, we're going to have a set of linked equations that we're going to be taking something out of one part and putting it back in somewhere else in a different form. 
So again, there's a lot of discussions about how you actually figure out how much intensity there is at a particular point inside your volume. You gotta allow for reflections and the transmittance and how you can link, how you can go away and figure out the intensity at a particular point inside the volume, given a die with some particular transmittance that you can measure. So how to link um, from measurements back into what's actually inside the volume. And we spent quite a bit of time trying to do that. Um, sorry, again, this is something, sorry, I seem to be going backwards, excuse me. Yeah. Sorry, I've got some confusion here, excuse me. Uh, okay, so um, again, the Lawrence Brands. And this here is basically saying, and you can't see it very well. I'm sorry, this figure again didn't come out very well. But we took our acrylamide, and I'll give you the reference later. We took our acrylamide PVA and a spatial frequency of 1,000 lines per millimeter. And what we did here is we measured our diffraction efficiency, and we converted it into a refractive index, OK? And we have an exposure time. And we produced the growth curve. And we basically fit this with the, with the numerics. And again, you can't see it here, but we have a very good fit actually in this graph. It's just the, the line doesn't come up here. Okay, I'm very sorry about that. And what we also did was we took exactly the same type of material. Okay, and you can see here, this is 0 0.005. So it's very weak modulation. Here we've got a modulation up to 0 0.0175. And what we did here is we actually exposed and we switched the light off at different points. So we switched the light off here switch the light off here and switch the light off here. And it's a little bit difficult to see, but what you find in these cases, and I'll show you a better graph maybe later, what you find is with the polymers that the curve, if you switch the light off, the curve continues to grow and then falls down, it decreases, okay? And it decreases in all these cases. And I said, we've done this process many, many times. And again, all of these are fit using the model and they've all got good fit over the entire range of the growth curve here. And the only way we could explain that, that it grows and then it decreases, was by uh, going away and examining the refractive index modulations and finding out that the modulation had a refractive index less than the background, which was associated with the polyvinyl alcohol. And the refractive index associated with the monomer was less than the refractive index associated with the polymer. Okay. So the ratios of these different refractive indices as they appear in the rinse rinse formula are critical to actually explaining what happens when you do this sort of multiple exposures on different layers. So these are all different layers exposed at different for different lengths of time to explain the full non-local curve and the growth curve. Okay, so to explain this full growth and all these partial growth curves and allow for this evolution afterwards. Okay, that's the, we had to allow for, we had to take consider this. And what actually brings it very far home is that if we take a completely different material, so this is an epoxy resin, actually doped with a completely different tie. And of course, we would have also done these types of growth curves with different dyes. So this would have been carried out with different periods, different illuminating intensity, different dyes. And we saw the same characteristic fundamentally dependent upon this relationship between these refractive indices. And if we came along and, we, and the graph, sorry, for the different dyes and everything, we would have substantially different forms of growth curve. But this type of characteristic, this dark evolution, depended fundamentally on these properties of the actual uh, Lorenz Lorenz. And similarly, we took a material like an epoxy resin with a different type of dye. And in this case, the polymer has a greater index than the monomer, but it has a greater index than the background. Okay, so it's, this is different now than the previous case. And in this case, again, we have a growth curve. And the growth curve here, again, as in this case here, you've got a dead band here. So you start exposing here and nothing happens. And again, you've got this, this is this early part here, up to five seconds. Again, we have this growth curve here. And again, we can switch the light off here. And now in this case, we have continued growth in the dark. So here's when the light is switched off, we have this type of growth curve here in this small region. And then after we switch the light off, we have this huge growth increasing the strength of diffraction grating. And again, we did experiments with different periods, frequencies, et cetera, spatial frequencies. Again, we come back and we find out that this fundamentally determines this growth, this continued growth in diffraction efficiency of refractive index modulation. And again, we get very, very good fits to these curves using the model we've talked about before. So we can take different materials, 
use the rinse rinse formula and independent of the other types of parameters we get different curves but we get this post growth and the only way we can do it is explain it is in terms of the rinse rinse formula and these particular refractive index which we have gone away and measured ourselves and also gone to the literature to find out what the values report in the literature are so if we did a search for example we would have done we would have a range of refractive indexes values that we would use in our search and those will be based as I said on our measurements in this layer and also our measurements from the literature so a photosynthesizer inhibition and macromolecules molecules okay so again we talked about this these generalized type formulas and we can go away and can find this type of expression for the rate of polymerization a time varying rate of polymerization and here we've got our intensity to raise a gamma we have our termination our propagation constant rate from these rate equations the inhibition the effect of inhibition the concentration of the inhibitor all of these things are affecting the rate at which polymerization takes place. So this is a big jump forward. If you remember previously, we basically, the first thing we had was simply that we had a proportionality between the rate of polymerization and the intensity. Now what we've got is we've got something which Bill takes account of all of these different factors. And again, if we boil this down, we can see we still have this intensity value in here, okay? before we have had the F times this concentration. But we've got all of these other terms that start popping into our formula. And this here is our concentration of dye. And again, this is still this is still an approximation. And we have an expression here for the intensity that's actually at a particular depth inside the layer. So the intensity varying as the light passes through the actual layer of thickness D, yeah? And we would use this, for example, we would measure this during our exposure process and how this evolves as a function of time. And we would use that to find out some information about these parameters as well. So we have a whole set of separate experiments, experiments using different types of arrangements where we can vary different materials and try and find out fundamental values, like, for example, the quantum yield. Yeah, we can vary these the initial dye concentration, we can vary the material thickness, we can vary the intensity, and we can do a whole series of experiments. So even if we can't find out, out, for example, a very specific parameter, we may be able to find out the product, the product of two terms, and then deal with that as a bulk parameter. Replace the original phenomenological expression by a more accurate expression. Now, so we're, we're, I'm going to keep going here, ladies and gentlemen, if you don't mind, and um, because there's a lot of stuff I just want to show you, okay? Um, the generalized model, we're going to have to take care of the material processes, okay? We've got the ground singlet and triplet state of the dyes. I showed you a diagram before which illustrated that the dye goes through a whole series, and this is only for the particular dyes we're talking about. We have the presence of this electron donor, okay, which is the intermediate between the excited dye and the actual radicalized monomer that starts the chain growing. We have the initiation process. We have bleaching. If we expose a layer, yeah, we can measure the transmittance. And if we switch off the exposing light and we wait, the dye will recover. But if we then go back and we then expose again, what we find out is that the absorption decreases, yeah, and if we then go back and we switch off and we so the amount of dye that recovers reduces and reduces because it's converted into a bleached dye dye that can no longer take part in the chemical processes and we're going to talk about two routes of bleaching and i'm going to show you that again using our models we can get very very accurate fits to the particular values for the bleaching the concentrations of the bleached term the bleached dye the inhibition process we talked about where you put light in and nothing happens the propagation of the chains and the termination processes and before we said oh well we assume that a certain type of termination process dominates or we assume this and therefore the governing relationship is is we put a gamma is equal to a half or we put beta is equal to two and we get the best fit but again i emphasize to you that those parameters would be derived at or arrived at by making some assumptions about things like steady state and of course in general we don't have steady state when we start off we have a dynamic process we're not working in the steady state we then eventually reach a steady state and then at the end of the process again we're not going to have a steady state so how do we deal with the general situation well again this is just a dye so just this type of process that we talked about this is a bleaching this is a dye electron donor down to this radicalized form here okay and we can write down a set of chemical equations the photon and the dye gives you the singlet yeah the singlet with a rate gives you a triplet, 
Yeah, the singlet with some recovery rate can give you back to the die. Yeah, so this is this, the singlet, recovery rate gives you back to the die. We can have the triplet plus the electron donor gives you this radicalized electric donor. The triplet can act with the oxygen, the inhibitor, to give you something bleached, or the triplet can recover back here. So again, we go back up here to our formula, excuse me, and we have our triplet can go back this way, can go back this way, can go back this way, and some of these we're just going to lump together. And at the same time, we can go to the uh, right there, and what we're going to get is we're going to get our, our, our lyco dye, our bleach dye. So again, I'm very sorry, this uh, bloody mouse is not working very well. Uh, so excuse me, yeah? I might just go down from the slides, okay? So we have then, that's the dye, and what we show at the bottom of that page is the associated differential equations, where we have the concentration of dye, yeah? Can basically produce a singlet dye, yeah, can recover from the singlet, it can recover from the triplet, or it can be turned into excited dye, okay? So we can remove dye or we can recover dye and the recoveries go back to the ground state. Simple, similarly, the signals, signals state, a fraction of it can recover back to, sorry, the, the, can recover backwards down to the ground, yeah, which is the, it's got a minus now, it was a positive in the differential equation above, or it can go forward to form the triplet. And again, mathematically, we can describe this in a number of ways. This is one particular way where we just have a fraction of conversion. And then the triplet state, again, we've got methods of generation and we've got methods of recovery. So we can couple all those chemical equations or chemical-like equations above can be converted into differential equations below, which basically then describe the loops that we have in our control system. So we got the three representations. We got our flow chart, we got our chemical type equations on the top, and we got our rate equations on the bottom. And similarly, the electron donor, the hydro dye radicals and the primary radicals, we've got a generation, a rate of change, yeah, due to being removed because they're radicalized. We've got the hydro radical, where we got the ED act, interacts with a proton, and again, that would be the loops. We've got a rate of constant bleaching. We've got the dihydro rate of dihydro, then it's a differential equation where we've got a removal and generation. And then the primary radical, again, we've got this idea that we have removal due to the ambition, this is the bottom. And again, we have a rate of equation which governs the removals and the recoveries, okay? And that's how you generate all these equations. And you can generate them to different levels, including different processes as shown in that loop diagram. So the inhibitor specifically here, we have a rate of change of inhibitor concentration. So let's see these oxygens, which can remove yeah, either the triplet state of the dye or can reinteract with the electron donor. We've got recovery of the dye yeah, from the singlet and the triplet state. And we've got the bleach dye concentration, the dye concentration that's been produced by the two into two transparent states that are no longer present. And if you write all of those differential equations down together, that's what you get, okay? There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine equations there, first order coupled equations. And I have to tell you, none of them are telling you about the concentration of polymer, okay? If we take all those equations, we're at the point where we're just about to make polymer. We're about to make polymer, yeah? So this is all about that first part of that graph, yeah? That Just that graph there. At the very, very bottom, we've just got the business with the ED, but we've got the business with the uh, inhibition as well. Okay, so we come down. And again, how are we gonna work with these? Well, we're gonna put a four-year series at the very bottom of that page. Every one of those parameters we're going to assume we can write as a Fourier series. And we're going to substitute that Fourier series into every one of those differential equations. And then we're going to get an array of first order coupled differential equations. We're going to get a set of first order where we're going to be looking at the amplitudes. I've got down there X sub J for every one of those things that's in a square bracket. Yeah, every one of them. So we can predict what happens with every one of them. And then we have to come up with experiments which allow us to measure the actual amount of things that are happening. And this here is the particular case. We got two completely different dyes, methylene blue and erythrocin B, okay? And what have we done here? We've actually found out the amount of lyco dye and the amount of dihydro dye, 
Okay, those dots represent experimental measurements and those blue curves are the fits to those experimental measurements. And we do those experimental measurements by basically taking materials with, for example, with no, with different compositions. So we, for example, we make a layer with no monomer or we make a, a layer which has no electron donor and we put in and take out various components and we find out how much the dye is removed after exposures and we can build up this. And what we can see here is we get very good types of fits for various types of parameters. Yeah, we're, we're really seeing inside this process in a real holographic layer. We're not doing this to dye in some solution. This is based on experiments with dyes in those layers. Okay. The other thing is with inhibition. So inhibition, basically, we put in light, and we've got here two situations. One where we've got a holographic layer, which is cover plated, so it's sealed, so oxygen can't get in from outside. And the other, which is uncover plated, where oxygen can get in from outside. And we put in light, and basically what we see is that if oxygen can't get in from outside, yes, this is the top curve, we reach this threshold point where we've used up all the inhibitor more quickly than in the uncovered plate. And we also have a faster rate of increase in the modulation of the refractive index. And again, this is fits of experiment to theory. In the uncovered plate, we have a different constants. We've got different time constants. We've got a different threshold because there's a dynamic process of oxygen getting into the layer, yeah? And neutral oxygen leaving because we have a differential there in the two regions. And we also have the possibility of stronger growth because we don't have the oxygen inside eating up a certain number of the radicals at every point. And again, we can go and look at our photochemistry and now we've gone from the dye, we've now gone into the process where we're actually producing polymer, yeah? And we're using up monomer, we're producing radicals. So we take the results from the previous case, yeah? Where we now have found out information about the radical generation and we can go away and calculate out the actual primary radical concentration. Then we can do the monomer concentration. And again, we've got our non-local effect there, that G, this is the second equation. We've got our macro radical, our polymers. And in this case, we don't assume any difference between po polymer chains of different lengths. We just assume we have a macro radical polymer. So our non-locality, the introduction of the non-locality, yeah, has freed us up. I ideally, we'd actually have concentrations of polymers of different lengths or different weights, but we lump them all in together into one single thing, this micro radical generation. And we've also got an equation governing the inhibitor and how it reacts, for example, with the micro radical and with the, uh, the, the excited monomer. And we have to allow for diffusion, yeah? Diffusion, for example, of the inhibitor. We saw above that there are clearly diffusion effects, for example, even from the outside into the layer at the very bottom there. And one of the things, of course, we wanna do is we wanna improve the performance of the, of, the, of the material. So one of the ideas we had was to introduce this chemical called chain transfer agent. I mentioned it briefly in the recipe. And by introducing the chain transfer agent, we actually produce, we provide a means to stop chains growing and initiate other chains. So we would stop a chain growing at a particular point but it wouldn't just stop, we wouldn't just terminate. We actually introduce a chemical which stops the chain growing and then initiates a new chain. Okay, initiates a new chain. Now it's a bit more complicated than that, but the net result is that we end up with uh, polymer chains which have a lower average molecular weight, but the actual result in terms of the structure that we're interested in is that the non-local parameter, the sigma, decreases in size. We have effectively shorter chains and we have a more localized chain growth, okay? Which is, uh, you know, anyway, we can write down the formulas associated with this chain transfer mechanism, and we can write down rate equations, and then those rate equations also become involved in the description of the process that's happening. And I note that uh, other people have gone on to use, uh, develop materials with other type of chain, tra chain transfer materials to produce even better results than we have. We've done this, and what we've shown is, again, best fits to numerous different types of materials. Here we're looking at the 2750s, relatively high spatial frequency in our material. And what we've got here is we've got a PVA material with a chain transfer agent, and we get a higher modulation. We basically get a lower, because we've got a higher, uh, more local, 
we basically get a stronger refractive index modulation. And the, for the less local material, the 71, we basically have a reduced effect. So we can't get a stronger grating. And again, you can see there, we get pretty good. Uh, we've got this confirmed pretty well. We've tried different chain transfer agents, but as I said to other people, Professor Tamisha's group went away and looked at a wider range of chain transfer agents and they got even better results. So we can use the model to give us insights, which allow us to improve the material. Okay, so another issue is the rate of diffusion and estimations of the rate of diffusion. And this became quite topical because people had received, got in the literature, they had got similar types of materials and they had, if you look here, you can see they'd actually talked about diffusion rates of 10 to the minus 14, 10 to the minus 8, and 10 to the minus 7 centimeters squared per, per second. And using the non-local method, we repeatedly got values of around 10 to the minus 10, 10 to the minus 11. So you're talking about several orders of magnitude here, below it, smaller than it, and above it. So the question for us was, and people were reporting about the exact same material and the exact same composition of materials we were working on. So this seemed to be a pretty big problem, okay? So we did a series of experiments. We want to look at diffusion in detail. We decided to make very large period gratings. So basically you have to introduce beams that have got very small angles between them. And we record gratings of periods of 75 micron, 150 micron, and 300 micron. And above at the top there on the right, you can see these fringe patterns. Okay, so we tested it to make sure we were doing what we said we were doing. So we came along and we probed this. And of course, if you've got very big periods, you've got weak gratings. And if you've got weak gratings, you're not going to be using the rigorous or Kogan-X theory. You've got to allow for in waves. You've basically got yourself a nice weak phase grating. Okay. In the bright region, polymers formed. And in the bright region, there's some shrinkage. Okay, certainly initially. But we've, what we've got is we've got two thin Ram and Nath gratings. We're going to have a periodic variation inside the volume of density. Of, of, yeah. And the, you're also going to end up with a surface relief grating. But that surface relief grating is going to be 180 degrees out of phase with the opposing pattern. So where you've got a high refractive index in the volume, you're going to have the greatest amounts of shrinkage. And therefore, you're going to have a minimum in the actual surface relief pattern. And the point is that because these two gradients are a phase, they're going to act against one another. OK, we talked about the phase relationship between gratings. So here's an illustration of showing the perturbation on the surface. Where it's dark, you've got a maximum. Where it's bright, you've got a minimum. And of course, you can watch the evolution of this as a function of time. And for big periods, this is going to be pronounced. If you put a glass plate on top of that and use some index matching liquid, the effect of that is to fill up the actual dips on the surface, okay? And therefore, to remove a lot of the effects of the thin surface relief pattern. Now, these surface relief patterns are generally not very important when you've got yourself a kogan lake type situation because the surface tension yeah, on the surface of the material will mean that they're so high that you get very little perturbation in general. It depends on your material, but in general, you get very little change. But if you go to big periods, this is going to be quite pronounced. And as I said, all the measurements that will be made in terms of diffusion constants, you use big, big um, periods because you want to have a long distance, for example, for the monomer to diffuse. So you can allow for this. And if you compare, if you compare the diffraction efficiency as a function of time for the two cases, the cover plated case, which are the two lower beams, and the uncover plated, which are the two top ones there. So the green and the blue are cover plated, and the purple and the red are uncover plated. Yeah. What you see is that you get appreciable differences in the variation of the measured diffraction efficiency as a function of time. Okay. And you typically use these variations, this slow variation, which is due to the diffusion of the monomer, okay, which is smoothing out the grating that's recorded, it's varying the strength of the modulation recorded. The monomer diffuses from the dark region into the bright region, and that has the result of increasing the index in the dark region and decreasing the index in the bright region inside the volume, and therefore weakening the grating. But it's all diffusion driven. 
and you build in a model which allows for the transmittance model for the thing grating on the surface. Yeah. You build that into your actual model. They uncover the cover plated, yeah, and your uncover plated cases. And you plot out the logs because you typically this diffusion is going to be some sort of a, an exponential uh, process. What you see is that in the cover plated, if you compare now in this logarithmic example, the log of the refractive index as a function of time, you see this big, very, very significant difference between the cover plated case and the uncover plated case. And so if you're using this graph to find out your diffusion constant, you've got to do the experiment and you're interested in diffusion constant inside the volume, you must cover plates, you must remove the effects of the surface relief grating, or you're going to get very wrong values for your diffusion constant. It's very simple that you assume your diffusion constant is of the refractive index, you're going to have a refractive index when the time goes to infinity, plus some variation which decreases with time, and you take the logarithm across their process, so you get a line type variation, and your diffusion is going to be related to this uh, uh, attenuation, yeah, this attenuation parameter that you've got here. Sorry, my mouse seems to have completely died. And the conclusion is that if we do this very, very carefully, yeah, we get a diffusion constant which is equal to 10 to the minus 10 centimeters squared per second. So you go away and you find out, you do experiments in your dye bit, and you try and tie down as much as you can what's happening in relation to the dye you try and tie down the lorentz lorentz formula and the refractive indices associated with the materials inside the layer. Again, you do a set of experiments to do that. You do another set of experiments to tie down what the diffusion parameter is and how, how big the range is associated with the diffusion parameter. And you basically move in closer and closer. You try and remove as many unknown parameters as you can from your calculations while at the same time increasing or separating out Instead of having lumped parameters, which depend on two or three things, like the R parameter, you might recall the R parameter, which depended on the rate of diffusion and depended on um, the rate of polymerization. Okay? So that was a lumped parameter, and we would have fit where we would have just used the R parameter, find the best R parameter. Now we clearly separate out the diffusion constant, and we separate out the polymerization constants. Yeah? And we deal with them separately. Now, I know you guys are interested in PQPMMA, and we haven't done a huge amount on PQPMMA, but again, the same process basically uh, applies. You have immobile PMMA molecules. You may have some MMA, which can move, and you've got mobile PQ molecules, and the mobile PQ molecules act like a dye, and they attach to the actual uh, P, uh, the, uh, uh, MM, the PMMA, and you can write down the chemical equations associated with this, yeah, just as we did above. And you can allow for the various radicals that are formed. And you can talk about your photo product formation. And you can come out and you can write your flow chart. Yeah, all the different reactions that are taking place, the recovery, the photo bleaching, the initiation, etc., and the photo products. And you can write down a set of differential equations. Now, as I said, we haven't done as much work on this. We published a few papers and we tried to be as careful as possible. Our biggest problem was we really didn't have access to a good source of PQ PMMA. And I talked to a lot of people. The, the person I would know who's done the most work that I know of with PQ PMA would be Ken Hsu, HSU in Taiwan, who's a very, very clever man. And I talked to him about our work and he said, well, it's quite interesting. He said, but you know, PQ, PQ PMMA kind of seems to change all the time. To control it is very, very, very difficult, okay? And if Ken says it's difficult, then it, I believe it's really quite difficult, yeah? And often the difficulty will be associated with, with things like how do you make the layers uniform? This is why commercial products are so interesting and so useful, certainly at least to produce a baseline, because part of the most important thing about a commercial product is that the layer they make today is the same as the layer they make tomorrow. And part of the reason we've stuck so long with acrylamide polyvinyl alcohol is we've just been working with this material so long, yeah, that we have a routine for producing it that basically means that our results are reproducible. And that's one of the biggest problems, reproducibility of these results, yeah. Uh, so again, we have our rate equations for PQ PMMA. We have our volume fractions associated with the PQ PMMA. And we come along and we get various values and various volume fractions in the material. And again, here's some experiment results, growth curves. Uh, we've got different periods exposed here. We've got fits to those results. 
and the fits are fairly reasonable. Okay, I won't say they're certainly not. I wouldn't be as confident in, in term in the PQPMA as I am with the acrylamide because we've done relatively little with it, and we had other people prepare them at samples for us, and we didn't have a huge number of samples, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But again, using the exact same process, we could come up with a physical picture, and we could characterize what was going Mr. on. Sheridan, excuse yes, me, if there is a question, or I believe the comment from Professor sure. Benyaminov. Sure. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, it's uh, yes, it's it's rather a comment than a question. Sure. I would just uh, like to um, to clarify the situation with PQPMA. It, uh, uh, I think there are two main types of this material. Despite the material itself is very simple, it's uh, uh, I, I can hardly imagine something more simple uh, yeah, yeah. In, in these light sensitive material materials. Uh, in that uh, th that sort of uh, PQPMMA, which we invented, well, I would say 30 years ago, uh, yeah. it consisted only of uh, PMMA and PQ without uh, any, sometimes without e even any traces of MMA. Yeah. While and I and I know I know just to say to you, I know actually the the process of eliminating the MMA or making materials pure without MMA is 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 itself a lot of work yeah yeah uh, that's true but I, I, the, what, what I, I wanted to uh, to pronounce was that uh, uh, it seems that the material with which uh, uh, the Taiwanese and uh, continental Chinese uh, scientists work it includes uh, um, well, a significant amount of MMA, therefore the mechanisms are somewhat different. Yeah. Now I, I have to tell you, are the samples we, we received were from Belarus? Yeah? Yeah. So, you know, and they were working in combination with people in Berlin. So Kowarschik in Berlin. Yeah. Uh, so I... Pardon, I, I think, I, are you sure it, it's Berlin? I, I, I think it, it's in Jena, Friedrich Schiller, Schiller University. Oh, um, well, yeah, sorry, it was, it was complicated because, anyway, it's, yeah, yeah, because the, the, the they had, a, it was postdocs in Berlin and then there was, there was, they were working with Kovacic who was in Jena, as you say. So, you know, and I don't, you know, um, so for example, my, the, a person I also work with in, in the America is, uh, is um, this man whose book I, I, I recommended, Kostuk. And Kostuk uses PQ PMMA because of the very high glass transition temperature. Yeah. Because he wants to make solar, solar elements. Okay. So I, I can tell you about what we've done and how we went about doing it because I'm quite interested to see if the methodology can be applied to different materials. Yeah. Uh, to to param parametrize them. And so, as I said, we've done acrylamide, we've done epoxy, we've done PQ PMMA, and we've done the covestro material. Okay, and in all cases, the results that we received are reasonable, and the people we talked to and we discussed the model with said it was a useful approach. Okay, a, a very practical and useful approach. Um, but I don't feel confident. Um, I don't feel as so. For example, in the epoxy resin we used, it followed Trentler. Yeah, the people in America that were pre in phase technology. And people have also applied the methodology to DuPont material, yeah? And in all cases, they successfully parametrized, they could explain the results they got, okay? At least they had a picture to work with. Um, so my feeling is that, uh, and the, sorry, the epoxy had a dye, er Ergocure, which a lot of people are interested in. And again, in that case, the dye is more complicated, but again, we could produce the rate equations and we could produce models that were predictive, yeah? So, it's a very general approach. It is empirical, but it seems to have wide application. Um, and that they, I don't want to say anything bad about anybody's material, okay? All I can tell you is, as I said to you, the, the realities of what we worked with. So I would not stand very firmly over our results with PQPMA. They seem very reasonable, but we didn't do enough experimentation to be uh, completely confident. Okay. I, I wouldn't. Yeah. We published papers and we were as careful as possible. But for example, in relation to uh, 
uh, Ergicure, our model of Ergicure, I'm very happy with that. And in relation to our work on Acrylate, my PVA, I really, we've really gone through it very, very thoroughly. Okay. And also Bayer, uh, you know, they were, you know, they, we, we, they paid us money and they renewed our contract. So again, I'm quite happy. And I, it's, they still talk with me. <laughs> so I think it wasn't, we didn't do something too stupid. <laughs> That's all you can say. Okay. Uh, I also say with the companies, uh, whenever we work with a company, the people we work with get promoted. <laughs> so whenever I talk to people, I say, look, you know, I can't think of a better, you know, we have succeeded in getting people promoted. I don't know if we've succeeded in doing any good physics, but we have succeeded in getting people promoted in the company. So they're paid more. So that I think is a massive success by itself. Yeah. Okay. okay. Now, some applications of this, and I want to talk about just two things. And um, I, we're in time, we're actually doing very well. I thought I wouldn't be able to get, get so far. Um, one was the scaling law of holographic data storage. Um, excuse me now, there's, I said that my problem here is, I'm sorry, this is cut off a little bit on the edge. Um, but um, for some years, um, there was a great deal of discussion about the scaling law for holographic data storage. And so this is a situation where you want to record a lot of gratings and you want them to be separate gratings. And this is associated very much with the idea of page, storing pages of data. And so you say, well, I want to store M, M pages of data. I want to store M holograms. And I want to have all of those M holograms have the same diffraction efficiency. Okay, and the question was, um, where does this law come from? And it's really quite simple. Um, it basically boils down to the fact that if you consider both the Bragg, the Koganek expression for diffraction efficiency, and you consider the thin grating uh, Ramanath type description for diffraction efficiency, one is sine squared and the other is first order Bessel function. If you have a low diffraction efficiency, you've got a very weak uh, refractive index modulation in one, and so for weak uh, refractive index modulations, you can approximate both of those expressions by the following the expression, which says that the diffraction efficiency is approximately equal to the argument of those of the Kogelnik expression squared. So it's proportional to the N1 squared. And if you come down then and you go to the, uh, to the uh, non-local model, you can go inside and expand, and I'll talk about this a bit later, but you can go inside and you can find the two wave solutions. You can actually find analytic solutions for both the monomer uh, amplitude and for the polymer amplitude for a sinusoidal grating, okay? You can find uh, analytic expressions and you can show that in fact, what you're trying to do is to take the monomer and split the monomer up equally amongst all these gratings. And so you can actually show that if you'd like, you've got a reserve of monomer and you want to split this, you want to divide it by M. So that N1, yeah, and this also carries forward into the polymer, that N1 is proportional to uh, one over M. The bigger the number that you're trying to equally portion the monomer up into, the smaller the M value and it's proportional to one over M. And so you can show that this scaling law as you increase the number of gratings, it gets better and better. One of the issues with the scaling law was that it doesn't work. It broke down as you had stronger gratings. So we did a series of experiments. Uh, sorry, excuse me. Um, uh, uh, sorry, there's a slide missing here. Excuse me. Uh, oh, sorry. L let me just look here, this, this for a second. We did a series of experiments where we recorded a number of actual gratings, but not a huge number. So we stored one, two, three, four uh, gratings in a single layer. And in that case, the scaling law is not applicable because the diffraction efficiency of the individual gratings is too strong. So we could modify the scaling law, allowing for the fact that you've got stronger gratings and show that our analysis was correct. And that was quite nice. Um, so let me just go back up here. The other thing I wanna draw your attention. So this, this is sort of like the idea where the explanation or the description of the model or the model provides you with. Um, gives you some insights into what is going on. Um, another thing you can do with the model, for example, is you can assume a very, you can assume no inhibition, for example, and you can look at a situation where you've got a very short exposure and what happens for the short exposure. And you can rank, yeah, you can see which of the various effects. So for example, the effects due to non-locality, the effects due to diffusion. You can find out whether the first order or second order effects in terms of the exposure time. So it gives you some insight into, you know, 
uh, which are the strongest effects for a particular type of material. You can rank them. Uh, holographic door storage. One of the other things that sort of came out of this was the idea of how do you optimize scheduling? So how do you record uh, uh, multiple pages uh, in such a way that basically all of them diffract equally? Um, so you want to store the data. And of course, the big, big advantage of the page wise over the bit wise is that in general, in the page wise storage, you can basically read out, read in very, very quickly. Yeah, the, 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 um, the bit wise has some advantage in terms of the, um, in terms of the robustness to tilt, for example. But the plain wise allows very, very rapid input and output read write. Uh, but one of the things is how do you come up with a schedule? to store. So you've got a volume, let's say, and let's say you're all recording all of the pages in the same position. Then basically you do an exposure and you record your first page. And once you've recorded the first page, you've used up some of the monomer. You've used up some of the dynamic range of that material. So when you do the next exposure, and assuming that the monomer is equalized after the first exposure, you now basically have less monomer to start with. And the net result of this is that you have to expose longer or you have to expose harder in order to record a grating of the same strength. And if in a locality you're trying to record 10 or 100 pages, you can see that this is going to get progressively more and more difficult. Every time you do a new exposure, you've got less monomer and you're going to and less die. And so you're going to have to expose longer or harder in order to get a page which has got the same diffraction intensity. And again, we're assuming here there's no crosstalk, et cetera, et cetera. So a question was how to formalize that discussion. So we came up with the following description. We said, we're going to wish to produce M sinusoidal gratings. So again, we're back to our sinusoidal gratings, but as we showed, I hope now in the previous discussion, when we talked about having N weak beams and one strong beam, when we talk about our holography, and we showed that we could come up with a rationale which explained that when we talked about electromagnetic model. So we want to produce M sinusoidal gratings in a single material layer of equal refractive index modulation. So every grating has the same modulation, and we maybe we have to allow for the fact that we've got different angles, etc. But let's assume they're all unslanted and they've all got equal modulation, and therefore they all have equal uh, refractive index modulation on Bragg replay. Okay. So there's a lot of if buts and maybes, but we're concentrating here more on the actual material than on the electromagnetic ideas. So we wish to optimize the total polymer generated. So we want to make eight great M gratings. We want to use up as much of the monomer inside as we can. And we want all the M gratings to have the same amount of uh, polymer in them and the same refractive index modulation. So if we take the two harmonic, and then this, again, this is going back and saying, look, let's take our uh, um, uh, equations. We have these coupled equations. And let's just retain, for example, in the case of the monomer, we're going to retain the zeroth or the DC term, and we're going to retain our actual modulation term. And what we do here is we say, well, we can split that description. If we take the two-wave case, we can find an analytic solution. We can go away and we can solve it and we can find an analytic solution. And what we find is that the analytic solution is equal to the initial value when Z is equal to zero of the monomer concentration, multiplied by some function here, we call it U bar. This is the first equation, okay? So at the end of the first exposure, yeah, at the end of the first exposure, we're going to basically have the initial value of monomer multiplied by this function, and that's going to give us the actual uh, concentration at the end of the first exposure. And we can go away and we can look at this, we can examine this, and we find basically that's like a cascade that we can write down a whole line of, of uh, values that show how this works. But the most important thing here is simply to say, look, Whatever the initial value is for the ith exposure, we multiply that initial value by this function, and we're going to get the final value at the end of the ith. And this u bar is given by this formula here. And you can see that u bar is only a function of that zeta i, of that exposure dose. And of course, that exposure dose may be written down as i0 times the time, or kappa times i0, or we may even put in our square root there. OK? Now, if we have this value, yeah, if we can describe the actual uh, uh, monomer value as shown, it turns out we can describe the polymer value in a very similar way. The polymer value at the end of an I, of a, of a ith exposure is equal to the initial polymer value multiplied by this n bar. 
and that n bar is given down below. And again, we end up with something which is just a function of the zeta and several parameters. We've got W and L there, but none of those actually depend on the actual concentration of the monomer. So we sort of separated out the behavior from the initial concentration of monomer, and we've shown that the final concentration for the nth ith case in both is simply going to be that initial value multiplied by these function. That function is going to be the same for all exposures. We're just going to change the zeta, the exposure value. And we can go away then, and we can come along. And if we look at the top case, we have there that the, uh, we have the formula we've already given for those two things. But we can show that, in fact, the u0 for the ith case, yeah, we basically multiply across by all of the by u0 at zero, so the very first concentration, multiplied by the various mathematical formulas, these u bars, for all of the exposures right up to the ith one. So we've now said, look, we can express the monomer concentration at the end of any exposure as the monomer concentration at the very, very beginning, multiplied by functions which are only a function of the actual dose used for each one of those exposures. And we can do exactly the same thing for the actual polymer. So we have there the, if we go down to the, the middle there, we have this expression for the component, the amplitude of the ith component, written down in terms of this, uh, the, uh, the um, monomer concentration at the end of the ith, and then we go back and we can actually write it down in terms of the actual initial monomer, polymer con monomer concentration. So we end up with that big looking expression for the total polymer, and the total polymer is given by the initial concentration of monomer, this product and the sum of the product of those mathematical functions which describe the variation of the actual monomer concentration with time and the function which describes the polymer concentration with time, how it varies. Now, we want to maximize the total polymer, okay? And we can describe the polymer uh, at the end of the I plus one in terms of the polymer at the end of the ith divided by this two functions. And so we can find out for the last exposure, so we go in M exposures, so we do the last exposure and we find out when that's a maximum and we can start from there. So what we're saying here is that, look, if we can find the amount of dose we need to make the last grating, so we're making M gratings, we want them all to have equal polymer. We find out the polar, the time taken to make the last one. And then using that value, the last exposure time, we can use we can use an expression like that for the polymer to work backwards and find the m minus one of m minus two. So we go to the very back bottom, we find the exposure rate for the last one, which will be the longest. We work backwards and find the time exposures for all the other ones, and then we can find the actual strength of the grating, and we can find out how to make the strongest grating possible. So if we have a general, and these now are the general curves of the polymer, and we show it there for two different R values on the left hand of that figure. Okay, and again, we recall that the R01 is going to give us distortion and the R equal to 10 is going to give us a nice sinusoidal grating. Okay, we showed that for two different values, yeah, for two different values, there are two different types of materials. What we can do is we can find the Z to M value for the R is equal to 0 0.1 quite handily because we've got a maximum. So the very last exposure, we're going to go up to the maximum. Yeah, so we can find the Z to M and for the R is equal to 10, we can arbitrarily pick a particular z to m value. Yeah, and the idea there being that simply we're going to do these exposures, we're going to leave over, there's going to be some monomer left at the very end that we're not going to use, but we're going to leave that over at the end so that we achieve a set of m gratings all having the same grade modulation, the same refractive index modulation. And so we can go away and we can build out a schedule. We can find out for a particular material which has a particular, for example, R value, our particular non locality, we can find out the longest exposure we have to make in order to achieve, if we have M exposure, so we define M exposures, we find out the longest exposure, the biggest dose we have to use, and then we work back finding out the schedules associated with all of the other gratings we have to find and the actual diffraction efficiency achievable. And the more gratings we record, this is an example, the more gratings we record, what we actually find out is we use more and more monomer, so we have more gratings, they have weaker diffraction efficiency, but the total amount of monomer that we can achieve, that we can actually use up, increases. So we get better and better use of the monomer, the dynamic range of the product. But the more gratings we have, the longer the last exposure has to be. Yeah, because as we have lower and lo less and less monomer, we're going to have to expose harder and harder to achieve the maximum value 
yeah, the best value. And so we can come up with a schedule which builds up and takes account of all these facts. Um, just again, at the very end here, just to show you something else. Uh, and again, I'm sorry, my mouse is dead. But if we have these non-latent materials, if we shine light into them, we'll actually cause them to vary. And one of the things we can do is we can go from uh, an output which is uh, uh, expanding to one which is basically flat. In other words, we can write waveguides in these materials. And we spent a lot of time looking at this idea of writing self-written waveguides. We've looked at the idea of actually uh, making blocks of the material and putting beams through it and watching the evolution of these waveguides. And also we put in complicated patterns, so various modes from different types of waveguides. And we've actually been able to smooth out the modes, eliminate the modes, or we've been able to produce these sort of um, uh, circular type beams, these annular type um, self-perpetuating waves. And we've actually shown how we can produce waveguides to, wave, to guide those types of beams. And we've looked at the image, the cross-section images. We've also looked at connecting fibers up using this material. This is all an acrylamide, so it's a really crappy material, but we've got misaligned fibers and we've shown how we can write waveguides between them and increase the coupling between them, even with reasonable amounts of separation yeah, between the various things. Uh, we've also combined beams. So we put two beams in there and they cross over and they form a single waveguide. So of course this could be used for multiplexing, demultiplexing. There will indicate some of the limits there, bigger than 5.6. Uh, with a separation of 13 microns. But again, we put the plates, we put the actual fibers down onto a, a glass plate, we pour the material over it and we let the material set and then we actually can do the exposure. We've also done things like causing two beams, to, working from the top left, two beams to go parallel, white waveguides parallel to one another, two beams that actually cause beams to uh, separate from one another. So in this case, what's actually happening is that the beams form the direction in which there's most monomer. And so they grow towards the regions which have more monomer. Uh, beams combining together and multiple beams. And we've done simulations as well as experiments. And uh, that's it, ladies and gentlemen. I thought I had another beam. I, I seem to have lost a couple of slides, uh, one or two, not awfully important slides, but still. And I'm very sorry, my computer just seems to be dying here. My mouse isn't working at all. It's just been sitting here dead. So I, I'm very sorry about that. Are there any questions? Okay, is there any questions from the audience? You can ask them right now. We have just some time. And we meet again tomorrow. So I will send these slides out. Um, maybe I find what happened to the missing slides. I thought I was working with the latest version, but maybe I'm working with an older version, so I apologize. But um, also you might see some typos there. I'll try and fix those if I can, but it, there's some strange things happening on this computer now. Um, so we'll have a chance to talk tomorrow as well, yeah? But I'll send this out today. Yep. Yep. So I can't see any questions from, from the audience right now. It's a lot of stuff, you know? Yeah, that's true. They said it was like 70 slides, if I'm not mistaken. I think so, yeah. Probably. Yeah, so it's a lot. But hopefully, again, I try to repeat things, you know. So, I, you know, you'll see even some of the slides are repeated, but I just talk about them in a slightly different context. And the derivations and the rate equations, I know it's really horrible when you put nine first order covered equations in a row, but hopefully you saw how it built up to that, yeah? And how it's the same thing for different materials. Not exactly the same, but the same form. Okay, I, I think that we can finish okay. for now. Yeah. So I will take care of yeah. trying to get this out so, to you as soon as possible. And then we meet again tomorrow. Yeah. And you have a link in the, in the schedule. Yeah. And we, we meet at the same time? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Very good. And again, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to email me. Yeah, so thank you, Professor Sheridan, for such nice and intense lectures. <laughs> okay, well, we, you, you thank me when everybody passes the exam, okay? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Ciao, ciao. Bye. I hope I meet you all some point, you know? <laughs>